Greetings, I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Before we start, if you're new to the channel, please do us a favor. Hit like, hit subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. And that past suggestion goes a long way. Hit the notification bell so you're alerted whenever we go live because we're constantly adding new shows and doing so many new episodes. I will warn you guys, this is a pre-recorded episode. Our guest today is a very busy person, so I was lucky to get the time. Figured record an episode, we'll air it later. I will be in the chat when this re-airs, answering some of your questions. As always, thank you to all the subscribers on YouTube and Twitch and the audio-only podcast as well. You know, all our patrons collectively you guys are the fuel and the engine that keeps tir moving along if you're enjoying what we do here and you have the means and you feel so inclined you would like to support you would also maybe like to have access to the patron only champagne rooms past and present be part of the live virtual audience for the pascal will bear my hour join us for movie nights well there's only one way let's become a patron for as little as three dollars a month for thirty dollars for the year can all be yours also tickets are still on sale for the book launch i wrote an extended essay that got turned into a mini book slash pamphlet i was a teenage anarchist about the cultures of authenticity and deconstruction and how they work together to nullify any sort of movement from gaining traction into the mainstream we'll be talking about that book we'll be talking about what's going on with the left also we'll be hearing stories from people that were literally a part of the fucking hardcore movement which i use as an example to explain a stagnant moving in the left so that's going down november 18th and wherever you are listening or watching this show there are links in the description so you can get tickets to that now we are in the early stages of native american history month no one really talks about that as much, and I don't know why. And there's a movie that's quite popular. It came out last month called Killers of the Flower Moon. But let's go beyond that film, because our guest today has a lot to say about the story afterwards. The, geez, probably 100, yeah, the 100 plus years after that movie takes place. Many watching this show have probably seen or at least... Uh, heard about the Martin Scorsese movie Killers of the Flower Moon chronicling, chronicling the uh, brutal Osage Indian murders. The Osage Indians, a tribe displaced from their Kansas home, then forcefully were relocated to what the U.S. government believed to be worthless land in Oklahoma. While the land was not ripe for farming, it sat on one of the largest oil reserves in the country at the time. For a moment, the Osage Nation became some of the most wealthy people in the rapidly developing United States. Their time as privileged elites would be short-lived. The United States government, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, using eugenic logic and state power, deemed the tribe leaders not mentally capable to run their newly gained wealth, so they supplied them with a guardian. I will say... Please watch our shows uh, that we did almost three years ago about guardianship. We recently re-aired them. It's a, still a very important conversation that, is, that needs to be had right now in the United States. The tribe gained their oil wealth by leasing the land to oil companies. The profits were distributed throughout the tribe. Every member of the Osage tribe got a share of the money generated through land leases for drilling rights. So the guardians simply extorted them. So the Guardian simply extorting them was like nickel and dime. Since the head rights or the inherited share of the oil revenue couldn't be sold, only inherited, many of the state appointed Guardians married and killed their ward. That's where Scorsese's movie ends. But the story of the Osage tragically doesn't end there. Our guest today, Greg Palast, has been working with the Osage for decades and has a documentary on the full history coming out in 2024. Greg Palast is known for his investigative reports for BBC, Democracy Now! and Rolling Stone. He has been investigating the Koch brothers for 30 years. And they are a big part of this story. Palast is working on a new film called Long Knife. Osage Oil and the New Trail of Tears to be released in spring of 2024. Please welcome the Greg Palace. (laughs) 
Greg, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I'm really happy to be with you. And that was a hell of a great explanation of, of what happened to the uh, Osage um, indigenous community, the tribe mm -hmm. in Oklahoma today. And yes, we've got a new film because I really want people to see the film Killers of the Flower Moon. You have to know this history, especially because uh, there's a lot of people who don't want you to know this history. Do you know that uh, the, the history, the, the film Killers of the Flower Moon by Martin Scorsese, uh, starring uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, is, um, is, is about uh, horrific events of 100 years ago. And what I'm doing, and, I, and you should see the film. It's, it's actually, I had to tell you, despite the horror of the story, it's quite entertaining. And I want you to see that film. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know what, and Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio want you to see another film that they've made, that they're making with me, Greg Palace, uh, called Long Knife, mm -hmm. Osage Oil, and uh, The New Trail of Tears. And what this is, is what happened to the Osage, as you mentioned, and I'll just do it in a quick clip, mm -hmm. is that um, in uh, about at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, they discovered oil on Osage property which was like, you have to understand this place. I've been, uh, I've spent a long time there <laughs> and on the reservation in Oklahoma, you can't grow a potato there, yeah. but they found, and that's why the, the Osage bought, they actually purchased that land from the Cherokee. They're the only reservation in America where the, where the uh, tribe itself bought all the property, just simply bought it. Like because they sold house. their land in Kansas when they had to move, in right? Kansas, because yeah, that's another story. Actually. And um, what happened is that, uh, they so they went to this. They bought this property, figuring white people aren't going to want this place because you can't even you can't grow a rock yeah. here. And uh, so they did some cattle ranching and just uh, they actually starved for a few years. They were down to just over a thousand wow. members of the tribe left after starvation and smallpox. And then they discovered oil, the biggest oil strike in America to that date in the uh, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, and. Um, so immediately the U.S. Congress said, oh, cow, we can't have a bunch of Indians owning all that oil, which we need to win World War I. That was the biggest oil field in America at the time. So they, the U.S. government literally took the oil away, uh, lo, um, leased it out to companies like Getty, Sinclair, and the companies which later became ConocoPhillips and um, Exxon. The oil giants. And this is where... These, I mean, Getty was nothing. Then he became a billionaire off Osage Oil. ConocoPhillips was nothing. Then, and their owners like uh, uh, Frank Phillips became billionaires off of uh, off the Osage Oil. But the Osage didn't get the oil. Instead, they said, "Oh, you'll get a little royalty, but we're going to put the royalties will go to a, a group of two thousand tribal members, which we'll designate, and we're going to say you're mentally incompetent. You cannot handle your own wealth." Now, you have to understand when they say that these people are mentally incompetent, when they got their oil wealth, yes, it, famously, they bought uh, uh, fancy cars and they bought airplanes and became pilots. And in fact, one uh, got uh, uh, the, I guess, the Congressional Medal of Honor or something. Really? For, for being the top uh, uh, pilot in World War I, top ace in Osage. And Osage became vice president of the United States and more in, important is that the Osage became scholars at Stanford, Oxford University, UCLA, and uh, of course our two the two greatest ballerinas in American history, Maria Tallchief and Marjorie Tallchief, the greatest ballerinas who've ever lived. They're both Osage. Uh, now, were they of mixed uh, heritage, or these are? Uh, well, most people are, are of mixed. You know, as you know, in the indigenous community in, within the tribes. It's just like uh, the African American community, the the uh, Jewish, Hungarian, and every other community that comes to America. You tend to meld with other people. And actually, the the Osage um, intermarried a lot with Ukrainians. Interesting. And they have a very close association with Ukraine. But what happened was the white. So the U.S. Congress said, despite people who have degrees from Stanford University and Oxford, mm -hmm. uh, they are listed as incompetent, and so they had to be given. Uh, guardians, white guardians were, were assigned to each native and the guardians changed their the, the wills to make themselves beneficiary, their insurance policy. Some of them married Osage and then murdered them. They literally murdered up to, we think, about 200 Osage wow. 
were murdered for their oil rights by these white guys who then inherited and inherited and uh, took control of the oil wealth of the Osage. Now, that's the story of Killers of the Flower Moon. Mm -hmm. And you should see it because the tribe wants you to see. I, I, you know, I work very closely with the Osage leadership, a chief standing bear and uh, the chairman, uh, Everett Waller. Um, I work closely with them, as as did Scorsese. Uh, in making his film, uh, he was insistent on making it on the reservation with, and the people that are playing the Osage there are Osage. Really? <laughs> it's not a bunch of, this is very unusual for America, where Hollywood actually said that the natives will play themselves. And one thing that the natives wanted to do, that is the indigenous people, the, the Osage, they want you to see, know what happened to them afterwards. In the hundred years, now that film ends with the killings, mm -hmm. the ring. Era, the Killers of the Flower Moon. It ends 100 years ago in the 1920s. It's 100 years. But they want you to know that they didn't disappear. They still have had to fight the last 100 years for, for their sovereignty, for the control of their own lands and powers and to stay alive. And one of the things that they ran into was a monstrous machine. After The Killers after the Killers of the Flower mm -hmm. Moon. You might know them. It's Coke Industries, Coke Oil. A uh, Charles Coke, Charlie Coke, the dad, uh, ended up. This is the story of the massive theft of the remainder of the oil. The Osage were left with a little bit of oil, and that oil was stolen by Charlie Coke. And that's the entire reason for our uh, new documentary, supported by Scorsese and DiCaprio, et cetera, and the and most important by the Osage themselves to let you know that what we see this monstrous billion dollar billionaire operation this right-wing death star political death star was all funded by oil stolen from the osage in the 1950s and 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 by 1960s 50 years ago the osage 60 years ago the osage were um they only had these little tiny stripper wells you know you see these uh you know what? They look like nodding yep, horses that go exactly up and down. Those little pump jacks. They had teeny weeny pump I, jacks that were producing. Are you ready? Only 15 gallons a day. Not even. Wow. A I, I worked in the Gulf of Mexico and North Dakota. So I. Oh, so you know all, all about, about this. There. So 15, yeah. 15, you know, these little stripper yep. wells. So you, normally when you get oil, you run pipes mm -hmm. from the oil wells to a tank. Mm -hmm. Well, these at 15 gallons a day, you're not running no pipes <laughs> nowhere. This is too expensive. So what they did was they hired this company out of Wichita, these little this little operation called Coke Oil, mm -hmm. to go pick up their oil from the oil tanks with tanker trucks. Mm -hmm. But the tanker trucks are arriving in the middle of the night taking the oil. And how did they measure the oil that they took? Well, they just left a little piece of paper saying, I took this <laughs> much oil. So they would take they would take uh, 60 barrels of oil. Mm -hmm. And write down 40. Wow. Mob and uh, just just because no one was watching. Yeah. And now that now, of course, the Osage, the tribe, the tribal members themselves are watching this. You know, why are they picking up oil in the middle of the night? Why do we trust this little piece of paper that said I took 40 barrels? Mm -hmm. Looks like they took a lot more. Mm -hmm. So finally, finally, the United States Senate held uh, uh, got word of this. Mm -hmm. And um, two uh, senators, Senator John McCain and Senator Dennis DeConcini, who represented Arizona, um, and, uh, and a lot of Native voters, um, said, we're going to hold hearings. And they held here. They hired an FBI agent. Uh, they brought in 50 agents, 50 agents from the FBI. Mm -hmm. But the, the leader was a guy named uh, Jim Elroy, went out in the fields and actually documented the, the theft. Mm -hmm. And our film is about the theft, but how, and there was an indictment, an indictment, just like Donald Trump was facing indictment for racketeering. Yeah. Charles Koch was facing an indictment for racketeering and theft of oil from an, from a native reservation, which by the way, is a federal crime, uh, you know, go to jail for 10, 20 years. Um, and, but the indictment was quashed. He got away with it. He didn't have to, he didn't pay. He didn't go to prison. And our film is about the FBI agents and the, the, the uh, Osage who fought this Coke oil getting away with 
literally just stealing all their oil, poison, dumping oil all over their land. Today, it's poisoned by coke oil's dumping. And this is the story you need to know that's happening today to the tribal people and their fight today. And so our film, if you go to gregpalace.com, that's G-R-E-G-P-A-L-A-S-T, you can see the trailer to know what we're talking about and this film, which will come out in spring. So this is the, there's a story. <laughs> well, where, wherever, <laughs> if you where, wherever you're uh, watching or listening to this show, there are links in the description to gregpalace.com where you can find Greg. Um, also, I want to know, have, I, I do have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, have the Osage been able to leverage uh, or were they able to leverage any of their wealth for any sort of legal justice or recompense in regards to the murders? Yes. Uh, ostensibly the theft of their uh, head right inheritance. Yeah, one thing that killers left, I mean, they try, you know, because... You can't like, tell a whole... You know, pe pe people talk about what was left out of killers, and even Martin Scorsese and 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 DiCaprio cry about what's left out. That's why they say you want it, you have to see the rest of the story in our documentary, mm -hmm. because, yeah, there's a lot left out, including the fact that not only did the Osage get the FBI... In, uh, into uh, investigating the murders. Mm. The Osage Nation actually paid the FBI. The FBI Whoa. was brand new, wasn't it? It was actually- The Bureau Edgar, of Investigation. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Edgar Hoover was a, was deputy director of an agency it was called the Bureau of Investigation, not the FBI at the time, the Federal Bureau. And uh, they didn't even know if they had jurisdiction to look into murders on Indian land until the 20, until the Osage tribe actually paid uh, the FBI, I think something like 25 grand, which is in today's money, about uh, $2 million. They said, we will pay you to come and investigate because every investigator we get here gets murdered. Ooh. So we need the, we need federal authority guys with badges and guns to come in here. And the Osage actually had to pay the FBI to investigate. This is the very first investigation of murder by the FBI. Cause until then, uh, you could kill a, uh, an Indian on Indian land, and it wasn't against the federal law. Whoa. Because don't forget, remember, American tribes, tribal members, mm. were not American citizens until 1924. 1924. And they didn't get their vote protected until the 1965 Civil Rights Voting Act. The 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, actually gave the vote to uh, not only Black folk, but to American natives, that's a very important to know. So these are people that that pretty much legally didn't exist. And so we're telling it, and that's one of the things that Coke was able to do. They were able to take advantage of the fact that these people had zero political power. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have a protected right to vote until 1965. And so uh, Coke was able to um, basically steal the oil and by the way, by, I was on this investigation three decades ago, as you mentioned, and I calculated the loss in today's money is $6 billion. Now you have to understand that until recently, the Osage were really poor. They'd been the richest people per capita in the mm -hmm. world, but they became some of the poorest in the world because of the U.S. government taking away and the oil companies taking away their, their, their wealth. And the little bit that they had left, coke oil steals it. And, and you know, one thing um, I should mention that you'll see in the film is that we talk about this guardianship because the Osage were considered incompetent, mm -hmm. you know, mentally incompetent. They can't have their own wealth. Well, I went to see the chief, Standing Bear, mm -hmm. uh, who's a terrific guy. And Standing Bear is, is one of the, is considered Oklahoma's top trial lawyer. He's a top Wow. Trial. And he is considered, and listen mm -hmm. to this, he took me over. He didn't even show this to Scorsese because he's never done this before. He actually took me over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs office mm -hmm. and showed me this big leather book that he opens up. And there was his name. He's listed as incompetent. This is a top trial attorney. I was just with, um, um, with uh, Elise Passion. Now, Elise Passion wrote the poem. Killers of the Flower Moon, which became the the, the uh, inspiration for a book, best selling book, and for uh, the movie. And the woman who wrote Killers of the Flower Moon, she's she was from, at Oxford. She was uh, she found refounded the Oxford uh, 
a poetry society and its publication. You know, these are people listed as incompetent. Oxford, Stanford, trial lawyers, a vice president of the United States. They are not competent to handle their own affairs. And I'm not talking about the 20s. I'm talking about today. Well, let me ask you this. Who, Greg, let me ask you this. And I, and I, yeah. You were with them. Mm -hmm. The Bureau of Indian Affairs still exists, if I'm not mistaken, right? <laughs> yeah, boy, does right? it. Yeah. But there's a native in charge of it. Is it Deb Holland? Is that her name? Uh, yeah, Deb Holland is the Secretary of Interior, which controls the Department, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and and that's very very valuable. I got to okay. tell you that if if anyone says there has been progress, mm -hmm. it makes a big difference. The problem that Deb Holland has, and and she is again the, the uh, um, a Pueblo native from uh, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. The problem that she has running the Department of Interior is that they've had these methods and laws that go back to this racist period of the 1920s, mm -hmm. more than 100 years ago. And so she has to do two things. She has to reverse the mm -hmm. law, which requires legislation or action. And she also has to clean out the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs of these people who look at the Osage as their as basically their their kind of property. Literally. And um, the reason, by the way, our documentary, if you go to Greg Palace.com, you'll see Long Knife. Long Knife uh, in, in Osage, in the Osage language, is the, is, uh, the Mahika, and long, which means Long Knife. And the Long Knife is the agent sent by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to control the lives of the Osage. They can't do anything with their own property. And again, they purchased all their property, but they're not allowed to, to do what they want with their property. Like you and I, I buy a house. I have a house. No one can tell me what to do in my property. I mean, there's environmental rules and there's other things, which of course we want to, uh, you know, fire laws, et cetera. We want to maintain consistent with those laws, but I don't have to call the Bureau of White People Affairs yeah. <laughs> uh, to ask if I can uh, plant trees in my property. Or I can build uh, an extra house or something. Yeah, that's, uh, there's no Bureau of, of White People I'm Affairs. There's Bureau of Indian I'm, I'm Affairs. I'm actually glad there's not, Greg. I'm glad there's no Bureau of White People Affairs. <laughs> that may be making the world a better place, not having that. But, but kind of kind of back to the whole Bureau of Indian Affairs, and, and again, this is I know this is just your opinion. Um, as I'm thinking about what you're saying, and I understand that, you know, Native tribes are kind of, sort of, but not really sovereign nations within the United States. Um, do we even need the Bureau of Indian Affairs or can we change the way it works? Well, it's, it's so bad. You know, you've now had 200 years of Bureau of Indian Affairs controlling native properties. Right. And so, um, we, what nearly 200 years. So we have to slowly disengage. And the first thing is to say, especially for the Osage who literally own their land. It's one thing when the U S government said, here, here's property for you. No, no, they own their land um, that we need to allow the natives of America, the American native population mm -hmm. to control its own destiny. Now that means, so when we talk about sovereignty, should we completely eliminate the Bureau of Indian Affairs? That's like saying, should we eliminate the Bureau of Veteran Affairs? What we don't want is abuse. Yeah. We don't expect the Bureau of, of Veterans Affairs to, to abuse and steal money from veterans or give all their money and resources. Imagine if the, if the Bureau of Veterans Affairs says, well, we're going to give all the uh, resources to oil companies. We would say that's insane, mm -hmm. but we can tell the Bureau of Indian, we can say the Bureau of Indian Affairs in America can, give, can say oil companies first. And we say, oh, well, that's how it works. No, it doesn't. We don't have to do that. So whether we should eliminate the Bureau of Indian Affairs, that's not the issue. The issue is, is what are they do? What are are they a Bureau of Indian Affairs or are they a Bureau of Oil Company Affairs, a Bureau of Energy Company, Coal Company mm -hmm. Affairs? That's the problem. And the reason, in fact, we, we ended up, the Bureau of Indian of, of Affairs or, uh, originally mm -hmm. was under the Department of War, as we called it during the Civil War, the Department of War. Mm -hmm. And because we were warring with, the, with these mm -hmm. people, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the other is that... Um, um, you know, then it became part of the Department of Interior. Why interior? What is what did native life have to do with interior? The answer is because again, it was resources. The Department of Interior was all about 
extracting oil and coal and other resources from our lands, from the interior. Mm -hmm. And natives are simply sitting on all our resources. We, we send them out on the Trail of Tears. And I'm talking, you have to understand, 90% of uh, the indigenous people died as they're being moved. The Osage went from 200,000 people approximately. Mm -hmm. They controlled the Mississippi from Chicago to St. Louis. Damn. They gave that up and went to Kansas under pressure under the 1820 Andrew Jackson Indian Removal Act. They were sent to Kansas. Mm -hmm. And then in Kansas, the railroads wanted their property. So they said, get off our property. So then they had to move to Oklahoma. By the way, they were going to be given 12 cents an acre for their property in Kansas. 12 cents an acre by U.S. by the U.S. Congress. And, but I will say Ulysses Grant, who was maybe our greatest president, mm -hmm. Uh, said, you know, these people fought on our side in the in the Civil War. The Osage protected the Americans during the Civil War, the Union, and um, we're not going to abuse them. So he raised the price a thousand percent, and they were able to buy the Oklahoma oh, wow. property. Okay, but but then here's <laughs> that sounds good, but then the U.S. government never paid. Whoa! So, the, so then the U.S. So what happened is, other than paying for the property. Mm. The natives move there and they're supposed to get food because there was nothing that could grow there. They're supposed to for three years get like food mm -hmm. and some funds so they could survive until they could establish a cattle ranching. The money never arrived and thousands died. In fact, they were down to a thousand uh, Osage. They most of them died of starvation and smallpox. And understand smallpox in the 1870s and 1880s. We already had a cure. We already had inoculations. You know, the um, they were brought over in 1721. We had inoculations against smallpox, but we didn't give them to the, to the Osage. They, so they all died. Uh, they died of starvation and smallpox together. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what happened there. But now today, then they find the oil. It gets, they, they become rich for a short time. They intelligently use it substantially for education forget all the big cars and stuff the education was the big deal they're they're, they're very they're always a very um educated tribe pahuska their their chief who talked with uh, general washington he spoke seven languages goodness you know these people they're they're actually some of the most highly educated sophisticated people forget among tribes against any american group mm -hmm. and uh then they just turned it over to coke oil Bureau of Indian Affairs sat there while they knew that coke oil was stealing. In fact, uh, Everett Waller, who's head of the, the chairman of the Resource Council for the uh, for the Osage, told the Bureau of Indian Affairs just a few months ago, when coke oil, when the cokes were taking three barrels and paying us for two, why don't you go out there and hang them right mm -hmm. then? And I have to say, Charles Coke personally was involved in the theft of the oil. It wasn't one of these things where there's like some corporate leader and there's people stealing below him. And they, they say, Oh, I don't know about this. He personally ordered the theft and he kept a daily track of how much was being stolen. And, and we talked to drivers who said they would lose their job. In fact, their homes might be firebombed. Whoa. I'm not making it up. If they, if they refused or ratted on Coke and their theft, I'm talking about serious. In fact, in our film, long mm -hmm. knife, You'll see an FBI agent, the chief FBI agent on the case, uh, investigating the theft of oil from uh, the theft of oil. Um, he was after he did one of his uh, uh, interviews with truckers after he secretly filmed them and then confronted them and said, "You got to tell me the truth. You go to prison." Coke oil was falling around, intimidating these people, threatening them, and then they had an armed tail on the chief FBI agent. Now, now this guy said, look, I fought, I, Jim Elroy is famous for stealing a quarter billion dollars worth of cocaine from the Colombian cartel. <laughs> this is not a guy that messes around, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So he's like the dirty Harry of, uh, of the FBI. And he said, I've gone up against the Colombian cartel, against the KGB, against the mafia, mm -hmm. and only Coke oil, only Charlie Coke, has ordered me tailed by armed men, you know, waiting for the chance to like take me out in the investigation. That's never happened. 
So what he did was, of course, he's smarter than these guys. You'll see in the film, he reenacts this for us. It's one of Charlie Koch's goons mm. is, is uh, trailing him. So he goes into a convenience store. We recreate this whole thing with a convenience store. He goes through, he's like the, he acts like the owner. He's the FBI, mm. you know, so he doesn't mess with anything. He doesn't care. Goes through the back, comes around behind the guy and then puts a gun, his revolt, his six mm -hmm. gun, right between this coke goon's eyes and says, now you tell Charlie Coke that the next guy he sends is going home in a bag. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> And he says, but he had to because who else? I mean, Charlie Coke. I mean, the the mafia wouldn't dream of like hunting down FBI agents with with armed goons. Are you kidding? I mean, and and yet he gets away with it. He's not in prison. No. If you and I pulled that stunt, we'd be breaking rocks and chain gang till the twenty third century. I'm not. I'm going under the jail if that if that happens to me. <laughs> it's not. It's not going to be a good look. Um. I do want to ask you just if, if do I have you for a little bit longer? I know. Yeah, yeah. Let's stay. Let's stay with okay. this. This is very important to me. Thank I, you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, here's a question, and I and I thought about this again. I haven't seen the film, but there is an obsession we have in this country with true crime, mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse. Um, yeah. Do you think this movie does a good job with the story of the Osage? Or do you think it can kind of become one of those things that'll feel like prolonged true crime um, where people kind of miss the overarching point of state yeah. power? Well, well, this is very important. Um, and uh, one thing you should know is that the Osage, as Chief Standing Bear mm -hmm. said about Killers of the Flower Moon, he said, this is our movie. Mm -hmm. This is our story. We simply got the world's best director to tell it for us. Yeah. So they, just so you understand, Killers of the Flower Moon, as my documentary, which goes with Killers, a long knife, um, this is pretty much directed by the Osage. This is normally not what I do. I mean, I do my own, no, great, no Greg Palace. This is, I do very independent mm -hmm. filmmaking. And, and, but in this case, I thought, you know what? My documentary, just like Killers, has to be the story of the Osage in their own words. Mm -hmm. It's not my story. It's their story. And in Killers, I think one of the, one of the things I want to give Martin Scorsese a tremendous up that most people don't know about. The book on which it was based, Killers of the Flower Moon, its subtitle is The Founding of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Founding of the mm -hmm. FBI. And it was a, the book was all about like this white FBI agent whose name was white, actually, and wore a white hat, uh, that the white agent came in and solved this murder mystery for the Osage, which is BS. I mean, I, I like David Grant. The, the author is very, very good. And he worked really close with the Osage. But the basic story, which made it a bestseller, was how wonderful the FBI is and how they came in and saved, you know, found the killers. That's not true. What happened was that the Osage absolutely knew who the killers were, mm -hmm. um, but they needed the FBI because it had the authority they hoped to arrest someone. In fact, they actually went to the U.S. Supreme Court. It wasn't until the Supreme Court decided in this case that you can't kill an Indian with impunity, that that's a federal crime. Mm -hmm. Until then, it wasn't even a crime. So, it, so what Scorsese did, which is courageous, he told, originally, Leonardo DiCaprio was going to play the FBI agent who comes in and finds, uh, finds the killers. And the Osage said, no, no, you're not. You're not going to have a film of, about the white savior. We get killed and there's a white savior from the FBI. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. This is about us. Mm -hmm. The FBI came in to confirm what we knew. And so Scorsese said, all right, let's do this honestly. And he told Paramount Studios that gave him over $100 million. Sorry, Leonardo will not be playing the, the, the FBI agent who saves the day. He's going to be pay, playing a villain, the killer. He's playing the horrible Burkhardt. He's, he's, gonna, he's yeah. going to create, be the guy who tries to kill his own wife, or we're not sure. 
he was equivocal about it. he really did love her his 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 oddly he loved his wife but then he tried to poison her um for her oil yeah. um very strange guy uh but um so DiCaprio's playing this this guy who's a villain who's who's killing his wife that he loves. It's very complicated. And Paramount said, are you kidding us? We're paying over a hundred million dollars to have Leonardo DiCaprio be a villain. Mm -hmm. That ain't happening. So they were ready to cancel the film. Of course, he said, "If well, then I'm going to cancel it if we can't tell the right story. And then he got Apple TV to agree to let him tell it the way he wanted. They And so they, they put up the money, but you have to understand Scorsese was literally willing to walk away from the film and all that money. Mm -hmm. Uh, if he couldn't tell it in an honest way, that doesn't make it a white savior film. And so you got to give the guy tremendous props. And so does the so does the Osage Nation give him props. But they also said, look, we didn't die 100 years ago. We're still here. We got 100 years of history. Can we tell that story? And that's why we're doing this documentary. And I'm doing it in their voices from their point of view. And, and if you don't like it, uh, Charlie Coke, then I'll tell you what. I invite you, Charles Koch, right now. You meet with me. We'll put you on camera. You defend yourself. You say that you're not a thief and a killer. Fine. Let's hear your side of the story, you cowardly SOB, because I know you're going to hide from us. You've always hidden from me. I've tried for 30 years to get this, this uh, monster on camera. So come on, Charlie. Tell your story. Here I am. Here's Greg Palace. Go to gregpalace.com, Charles. And just say, yeah, I'm ready. Let's you talk. You heard that? You heard that? Uh, you heard that, Charlie? Okay. Hey, Coke. <laughs> We're coming for you. Now. So, uh, <laughs> um, here, what can be done moving forward for the Osage? What What do they want from this movie and the subsequent documentary? What What is their message to us, the viewing public? They want you to not be stupid about their history, to not know it didn't happen. They want to know that all these Osage were killed for their oil. They want you to know that the oil was stolen by the same people who were stealing the democracy of our country. Because remember, this is where the Koch family fortune, now 120 billion, began, the third richest family on the planet. This is where it began by stealing the oil from, uh, from the Osage. But more important, they want you to know that they're still fighting for control of their property, control of their of their future. And you know, and and that's what they want you to get on this because they have a goal. They ha and they have some specific things too. One, that the BIA, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs get their foot off their neck and stop calling them incompetent. Uh if you want to be if you want to be competent, you have to pay a massive massive amount of money to the BIA. It's just completely ridiculous in the state of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Um but even more they want you to know what really happened. And right now, they have a very practical problem. These oil companies that came in and sucked out all their oil and became billionaires, Exxon, Getty, Sinclair, ConocoPhillips. They left, are you ready for this? 16,000 abandoned wells on the reservation. Wow. 16,000 wells are abandoned. Now, understand, that's bad for the Osage because you have. if you go to these sites, you'll see all this oil spilling out and all over the place, which goes right into their drinking water, right into the water for their cattle and poisons their cattle. Mm -hmm. They want to clean that up. But but from our point of view, from a, for those concerned about global warming, 16,000 wells are leaking methane into the ozone. This is a, a climate warming disaster, the methane that's coming up from those wells. And they are they're asking and pleading for the oil companies and the government to help them close up these wells. They're doing one at a time. It costs like 50,000 to half a million dollars to, to just clean up and close up a single well. We got to close this stuff up. And then ultimately they want to be able to take out the remainder of their oil, which is almost done, and then go and uh, switch to geothermal because they have a huge amount of geothermal steam power which is very green power because it's just steam from the from the uh from the earth and they are sitting on top of all these geothermal resources and they would like to convert from oil to geothermal which is not only good for them but obviously really good for the rest of us and uh so that's what they need and they need whether you remove the bia or just get the bia to finally recognize 
their intelligence, authority, and sovereignty, uh, that would that would work too. But the Osage wants you want to get across this point that they need to have control of their own lives and their own property. And the reason is they need to protect themselves and their children and ourselves and our children from this pollution disaster. So to that point, uh, I also saw you post on social media recently. Um, I do follow at Greg Palast on Twitter. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, that that the Oklahoma School Board is trying to ban this history, this specific history. Yeah, and is that a coke backed politician that's on that uh, tyrant? Yes, and in, indeed, uh, um, you have this push. Well, first of all, the uh, the coke the cokes uh, the daddy coke Charlie Charlie Coke's dad founded the John Birch Society, the Uber right wing. Yes. Uh, group that and that was behind Joe McCarthy mm -hmm. and the Red Scare and uh, the Blacklist, et cetera. And one thing is one of the last gasps. So Charlie Cope took over the John Birch Society, Uber right wing, and uh, put out a pamphlet, which I have, against um, against uh, tribal sovereignty. Because, you know, so they were trying to say, oh, these are just a bunch of terrorists. Well, attorney... Standing Bear is not a terrorist. Um, and Chairman Waller is not a terrorist. They're people just trying to protect their homes. And they don't pick up guns against anyone. They've been shot at. Mm -hmm. There's still killings, by the way, as, as the tribe explains to me. There's still people getting killed for their oil rights. This is an end in the 20s. Jesus. This is that it's much more subtle. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to investigate. And the FBI still doesn't investigate. You know, it's like there's deaths all over the reservation and no one's getting an explanation. So, um, uh, yeah, so the, uh, like you say, the, the Indiana legislature, the Republican legislature passed a law against, and you'll be, uh, I know a lot of black folk are certainly familiar with this, against so-called CRT yeah. in schools critical race theory well you know forget critical race theory what they're saying is you can't teach history mm -hmm. in oklahoma schools as a result are you ready for this uh, this new law that was passed here there the lieutenant governor of oklahoma said oh we got scorsese to make his film here they didn't that was the tribe mm -hmm. we got and he spent 127 million dollars in this state mm -hmm. and um and, uh, but then he doesn't add, and by the way, the book and film are banned from all our schools and all our libraries yes. and our colleges. No, the colleges? If you, yeah. If you teach, if, if a teacher teaches from the book or shows the film, mm -hmm. Killers of the Flower Moon, you will not only lose your job, you will lose your credentials so you can't teach anywhere. Uh, the school will be will lose its accreditation. Do you know that the school system of Tulsa, which had the book Killers of the Flower Moon in its libraries, had its accreditation downgraded by the state? Because here they're promoting, oh, we got all this money from this film, but don't dare teach it. Don't dare let anyone read this book. And I know that my documentary, Long Knife, mm -hmm. um, is absolutely banned. No teacher is going to have, is going to jeopardize their job. They would literally lose not only their job, but their teaching credentials. So they're permanently fired if they show our film or killers or have the book in their classroom. It is this amnesia is really serious. And by the way, it's another, you know, I'm doing two films with DiCaprio. Uh, George DiCaprio with his son's support is also doing a film about Georgia and vote suppression called, we have a, we had a film, Vigilante, Georgia's vote suppression hitman. And there, Georgia also has banned the teaching of uh, of history there so that because, you know why? Because their governor, their Republican governor, Brian Kemp, his family was the first to bring enslaved Africans to Georgia. They're the ones who brought Whoa, Africans to I didn't, Georgia. All the things I've heard about Kemp, I've never heard that. Well, go and go to gregpals.com. Now, the movie, the movie we're putting out, a, so with Long Knife, mm -hmm. we're going to be issuing another movie. Mm -hmm later in the year, next year, called Vigilantes, Inc., America's Vote Suppression Hitmen. And a lot of it will be about this refusal to look at history. Because when you look at vote suppression and taking away votes, you have to go back to the history of, of, of enslavement. You have to go back to the history of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And you have to teach that history. 
and about the Ku Klux Klan or, um, uh, you know, and, and they don't want to teach that history because Brian Kemp, Brian Kemp's family was the very first to bring enslaved Africans to Georgia, which, by the way, most Americans don't know that Georgia was one of the only territories in the colonies which outlawed slavery. Did you know that? That, that Georgia actually had, that it was the South, not the North. It was the South that outlawed slavery. And then um, Kemp's ancestors in the, in the 1860, in the 1760s, mm just before the revolution, got the King of England to give them a special charter to bring in enslaved Africans. And this led to a big revolt by the local, not only black people, but white people, the Swiss and Germans who lived there and said, you know, if you enslave people from Africa, we're going to be enslaved ourselves. Cause we have, to, you know, factory workers see yeah. this now today. Yeah. If you, you have to compete against China and, and mm -hmm. a factory slave, you know, uh, that the, the Muslim Uyghurs are enslaved working in, in uh, factories. You can't compete against that. And the people in Georgia understood that, that they can't compete, that they would, that the average worker becomes a sl enslaved themselves to the system of slavery. And we put that in our film, Vigilante. So you'll see that as well. And that's also backed by the DiCaprio. So they're looking at this history, at this whole issue of, of uh, of uh, um, historical amnesia, and this goes about the American natives. This goes about uh, African Americans. Without history, we are lost because we're just going to keep repeating the same um, horror show over and over. <laughs> I am 100% with you, and that's what we try to do on this show a lot is definitely have history discussions. Uh, in closing, what do you hope to accomplish with your documentary that uh, the three-and-a-half-hour feature link didn't do? Well, the three-and-a-half, it's already three-and-a-half hours, Killers of the Flower Moon. By the way, it goes by quickly. Um, <laughs> it's a great, it's a very entertaining film. It's, it's kind of an old-fashioned thriller, romance, detective story, brilliantly told, and incredibly accurate. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to get out of that and our film is that that's an important story of a hundred years mm -hmm. ago. Now you need to know the rest of the hundred years. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the connection you'll see in the film, a guy, Everett Waller, who in the film plays a, a medicine man. Um, um, he plays a uh, uh, red Eagle, a medicine man today waller is also medicine man so basically they took the same guy and brought him back a hundred years to play himself oh wow and he gives and he gives a long speech waller and understand in the film he's the medicine man for the tribe mm -hmm. the wise voice but he is today and he want and so what he did was he gave a speech scorsese didn't write it let me tell you something uh Chairman Waller is not going to let some white guy <laughs> tell him what to say to say to people in his own tribe. Because remember, the camera's on, and he's not an actor. He's just the medicine. He's the medicine man today, and, he, and he's talking to his people, the chairman of the Resource Council, and he talks about white man's poison, which is their money, their lust for oil, and he said this is poisonous, and this has led to our genocide. Now understand that in 1920, the term genocide didn't exist. Uh, he, because you know what his speech is about? What's happening today. And he wanted to make sure that Scorsese got into the film a discussion, not only what happened then, but what's happening today. And Scorsese left the entire speech, which Waller, these are Waller's own words. They're not, it's not a script. Telling you what's going on today. So you got to understand that what you see in the 20s has changed its form, but it's still going on today. And they want you to know that. And that's why they've asked us to continue you know, can you add something which says, here's what's happened the last hundred years? And, and I think it's good because America, you get to understand our history. It's not just their history, our history. It doesn't make us bad guys. I mean, my parents, my family came from Eastern Europe way after any of this stuff. And um, it's not about trying to make white people feel bad or any of that stuff. That's nonsense. This is about our history. And some of it you know, is positive. These people have taken steps to get back control of their lives, to rebuild their lives. The tribe is thriving right now, but they're in a war for control of their properties and lands, but they're 
they're doing very well because they're very, very highly educated people, probably more than almost any other group in America. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to understand both what they're facing and their hard won triumph of today. His name is Greg Palast. Wherever you are watching and listening to the show, there are links in the description to his website where you can see other uh, documentaries that he's uh, put out. And are you a native Californian? Uh, yes, I am. I was born in um, in uh, the anus of Los Angeles, which is Pacoima Sun oh. Valley, right next. When I say the anus, I mean literally. It's where the sewage plant is, the garbage dump, <laughs> and the and the coal. Uh, what used to be a coal mm -hmm. plant. That's where I was born, at the very bottom. So I understand what it is to be kind of, you know, controlled tribal entity. That's what we were. And I've never forgotten where I come from. I, I appreciate your work as also a native Californian. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. So um, <laughs> okay. I, I always see that kind of ode to California and the stuff that you do. I love it. So, uh, Greg, have a great rest of your, uh, your day. And thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Great program. Thank, Thank you. you. That was the Greg Palast. I know this is pre-recorded, but we'll be going to the champagne room. So if you're already a patron, go ahead and meet me and hopefully Tucson over there. If you're not a patron, what the hell are you doing? Don't you want to go hang out? Talk about this some more. I'm sure there's so much you guys want to say with us on the screen because and this is pre-recorded. I can't respond to your comments. I'm sure there's so much you guys are saying right now. You're yelling at me for not asking A, B, C, D, and Y. Go yell at me in the champagne room. And we'll laugh at some hilarious videos. But on that note, I, or we, are out. <laughs>